My name is Paul Williams and I am an animator. I started off doing a hand-drawn paper pencil. Um, I think some people call it analogue now, which confuses, <laughs> confuses me. That went on for a few years. I think the first project I worked on was Asterix and the Vikings as an assistant. And then um, I worked on um, The Illusionist. And um, I think more or less over the last few years it's been uh, digital animation with uh, mostly 2D paint. I think I was uh, 28 maybe 27 when I got into animation. Um, I'd begun as more of a traditional artist uh, painting and I think I was at college and I'd heard someone say that you actually get paid for animating and I, I just couldn't believe it for some reason um, in the UK we, we don't have uh, such a, a direct access those days to uh, the idea that you can animate it's more traditional arts and film and as soon as I found out, I almost became obsessed and wanted to become an animator. I remember for the last year of my course, I'd got in contact with um, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson from uh, Disney. I found out they had this website called frankandollie.com. And um, at that time, I had this idea of making this uh, short film on a squirrel. And something in my work probably got him liking an idea about it so for about three months I was able to correspond with him over the short film idea. Um, it was all done in those days in movie file and email and um, it was before Animation, Ment Animation Mentor came along so uh, it, was, it was a unique experience. Culturally I love the, uh, the arts history in Japan and, and the, the country. Um, the, the, the nature, the wildlife, the, the aesthetics. Um, obviously they've got a, a huge uh, industry in animation and um, a great variety of films as well and TV series. In a career sense, in Europe, I've, I've done quite a lot of traveling, working on different kinds of films. But within Japan, I can see there's a different type of film that's being done or a different type of uh, subject matter. Um, the characters are treated differently. I remember seeing a film, it must have been this year, called uh, A Silent Voice, I think. And it's, it's just the levels that that kind of gets you as a story. I do find myself gravitating towards these kinds of films where you see kind of a lifetime of a character. It doesn't always end up very well, but there's always a very strong moral behind it. In Japan, yes, yes, I've worked. I've been lucky enough to work on uh, two projects so far. First one was Atom: The Beginning. Um, there's a few small shots that I got to work on for that, um, mostly of the uh, the cat. That was a great experience, really, because in Europe you you're given um, a scene. If, if it was in paper and pencil, you'd have the the character that you animate. Sometimes there'll only be one character in a group of six or seven, you just get a section. But in Japan, you, you get like a, a rough storyboard and then model sheets of the location, uh, model sheets of the characters, and uh, notes on uh, certain visual aspects of the scene. And you almost like a director where you have to design what the audience see in your first pass. So you kind of do the layout, you do the, the, the shadow notes, uh, the lighting, the, the perspective, the detail, you, you know, you, you really have to sort of take in so much more. As an animator coming from Europe into Japan on that, those kind of scenes, it was uh, liberating and enjoyable to uh, tackle that. They've done everything in that scene. It was in Europe, you'll have an effect specialist or you'll have a, a layout artist to do even the rough stage of the background. For this particular batch of scenes, the, um, the background supervisor would do the final background um, based on the drawings that I did. We might make a few adaptations or adaptions. So when you get the scene back, and then you have to um, pretty much just, just do the keys. No in-betweens. Um, in Europe, we tend to do quite a lot of in-betweens in our scenes so we can get the action flowing around. But um, it's in order to create a, um, a stepping stone or a learning pattern for the assistant to get into animation, because over here, they have to in-between. They, they have to learn 
from the cues that you've done how to complete that scene. Whereas in Europe, the assistants almost become like cleanup artists. You've done everything almost. Uh, they have to pull it on model and keep it tight. Depends on the films, but I've noticed more in the last um, four years, maybe five, that the animators have had to work tighter and tighter. Again, there's, there's great things to learn from both sides, but I'm particularly drawn at the moment from a creative aspect from the, the Japanese approach, the level of creativity they give the animators, and uh, by the sounds of it, or the looks of it, the, the opportunities they give the, the assistant animators as well. The visual style of European animation started to become more um, a French visual, you know, with strong anatomical drawings, whereas before it was almost trying to imitate a bit the, the American style. You had films like Asterix and the Vikings, Chester Till, films which are visually more in line with the American style of animation. And from the illusionist, it became almost, as I was saying, 101 Dalmatians stroke, um, French comic, Nicolas de Crisis, Sylvain Chaumet style. And with TV paint, and you can notice it between the illusionist and, um, say for example, the Red Turtle or Ethel and Ernest, the amount of times you can almost perfect um, an acting pattern or, or something. In TV paint it's a lot easier because with uh, paper and pencil you're almost limited to how many changes you can make until that scene works. There are certain things that would have been approved on paper and pencil because they had to be approved. With in TV paint, it was so easy just to go and say, okay, I want that character to be 5% smaller. So you just reduce the size and paper and pencil, you had to go to the photocopier and resize the thing, and then just work from those keys and redraw it. But in TV paint, it would have taken me a couple of hours rather than a couple of days. <laughs> in Japan, I can definitely see TV paint helping the industry a lot more. There will be more possibilities on different styles of animation. I think it's just a question of when, not if, um, especially with a lot of the younger animators now, because you see on Twitter, and you know, it's almost like they're animating for fun using digital form, you know, there's TV paint or there's flash or whatever it might be, and it's just a quick test, and it's just so quick and easy. Um, if I, I think I've been told in Japan they don't use line testers so much over here <laughs> so you know you can really flip the drawings um, but in Europe we used to use line testers a lot so TV paint really helped us <laughs> in not having to queue up for a line tester and then if someone's changed the camera which happened a lot on the illusionist uh, you'd always put a note on there saying do not move and then you go back and then you find out someone's moved it and those scenes were like a thousand frames long at times <laughs> so you literally had to go back in and reshoot it and then the, uh, once or twice the software would uh, play up, it'll uh, jump frames about. You in TV paint, there's, you don't get that. You know, it's, um, it's, it's really, really handy, really helpful. When I came over, um, it was for the premiere of the uh, Red Turtle, and it was around that time I'd mentioned to a few studios I was coming over, and I, I got a reply from uh, Signal. MD and um, they uh, they invited me over. I had no idea why or what for. They just invited me. It hadn't really been the intention for anything ever just to see a studio here. And that was a, that was a really nice relationship because at the time I'd uh, managed to come back to Europe and I was working in so many different locations. I think I was working on uh, in in Reunion Island and I was having to uh, supervise on uh, Funan. I went over to Holland and I was working there. So. All the while I was jumping around, I was still working with um, Japan on uh, various shots. And you get your your notes and your talk, and you, you have your full creativity on that first stage. And you send it off, and you get the scene back, and it's um, drawn over model, uh, notes, um, background updated. And that is a really easy system as a freelancer, because there is there's no questions, there's no need to ask, well, do I have to send in three or four different versions of the shot with uh, a little tweak to the arm or a little tweak to the face? It's all done because um, the model you get on top on that after that first pass is spot on. It's a model. And that would be one big difference between the Japanese animation and the, uh, the American or the, uh, the European in terms of freelancing. Because within American and European, there's a lot of uh, cherry picking. You know, it's, it's almost like cherry picking something. It's, it's always with the aim of be getting the best that you can from the scene. But as a freelancer, there's, 
it's, it's almost demoralizing when you see a shot and it's on version 7, 8, 9, 10 and it's all these small changes. It happens all the time, it happens in the studio but as a freelancer for every hour of your work the, the set wage is spreading out. Um, but within the Japanese productions it's the first time I worked as a freelancer where I get a scene, I, I send it off, I get my uh, notes back and I send it back and it's approved. That was fantastic but I say with Japan, um, I've, I've been over here a couple of months but I've been mostly working on um, learning Japanese and um, visiting friends and also trying to um, get my uh, visa application done. So once that visa application is uh, put through and touch wood is approved then I can um, go to studios and uh, make contacts. It was mostly with that in mind the amount of paperwork I'm having to go through at the moment but uh, I've tried to uh, sort of take my finger off the emails and just relax a bit. <laughs>